You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half and the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. everybody and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. If you are new here, welcome and consider this your warning. I have been known to use what some have referred to as colourful language on this podcast and um, if you are afraid or, you know, just not super into expletives... Um, because I talk the way I talk. And if you don't like that, you might want to exit stage left. Okay. Now that that's done, everybody else, welcome back. How's it going? Have you had a good time? I have had a relatively calm weekend. Like, I'm currently <laughs> so busy. But, uh, yeah, a relatively uneventful weekend, considering, because I'm doing renovations. And I am now sorting through all the clothes. But we had fucking heat wave right we had a heat wave in ireland and there was a heat warning so it hit like 28 degrees um in some places it was hitting 30 and that's celsius that's like a hundred that's like 80 to like 90 fahrenheit or whatever and we had humidity as it turns out that was the same as florida and this is in an area that is built to retain heat like That's the whole thing. UK and Ireland, everything is about keeping in as much heat as possible. So, like, 28 degrees, right? In Spain, it feels like 28 degrees. 28 degrees in, you know, Italy. 28 degrees, right? 28 degrees. 28 degrees in Argentina. 28 degrees. But 28 degrees in a temperate zone somehow feels like your skin is melting off. Like, it was so humid, like, I felt like I could bite the air. It was like walking through soup. It was unpleasant. And people were like, mm, well, don't come to Texas and don't come to Florida. And I was like, I, I wasn't planning to. Um, like, no, not in this level of humidity. I will do winter tours. Thank you. But no, um, I ended up messaging Ben Brainard. I don't know if you know him. He's the, the States guy on, on TikTok. And we were just like chatting <laughs> for a couple of hours um, about, well, the heat. Because he was like going to make fun of me. And then he realized that like we don't have AC. There's no air con here. You know, it's just deal with the heat. And then everything is sort of multiplied because everything is designed and built to hold in that heat and keep that heat and to try and amplify that heat. So it's it's not the best of things. Um, And then we spoke about hash browns. <laughs> Because it was 2am and I couldn't sleep because it was too humid. So thanks, Ben. I really appreciate you helping me out because that was just... It was helpful. It was helpful. And I did get to make a Shrek joke. So it was all fun. But yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know this. Um, If you've listened to the previous episodes, you might. But I have applied for the Irish Podcast Awards and the listener's vote is open. I'm going to put the link in the description down below. So you click on the link, you can vote for the listener's choice. You type in who did what now, because that's me. And you vote for me, because um, I'm I'm an it. And that would be great. Like, you don't have to be from Ireland, I'm just saying. But you do have to, like, 
put in your email address and then click the link that's in your email and vote for me because I'm awesome and you love me, please. <laughs> I'm like so conceited. That's very conceited. Um, also, I'm going to the Murder Most Irish live show. So I met the, the two girls and Colin at the Irish Podcast Awards last year. And I was struggling to find somewhere to stay. Like I was freaking out. I couldn't find anything under like 350. I was like, I need just one night. Unfortunately, it was one of the nights Garth Brooks was playing in Dublin. Garth Brook? No, Garth Brooks was playing in Dublin. And so everything was just like mega chocka full. But I managed to get one hotel on Temple Bar for like 250 quid. So it was a really, really good deal. Because, you know, it's Dublin on a Friday night when everything's sold out. So I get this deal. But like, anyway, I am at the awards and we're having like the after party bit. And automatically, like Sarah Jane's just like, you know, not to be weird, but if you didn't find anywhere to stay, you can come stay with us. Like, we promise, like, we're not going to, like, kill you. Uh, and I'm like, you host a murder podcast. I feel like you could. But no, I'd already said everything sorted. But, like, off their back straight away, we're just so kind. And if you don't vote for me, um, vote for them because they're amazing. But I'd say they're going to be in the true crime um, category. And I hope... That I'm in the history category because they're they're announced on um they're announced on Thursday. So that's the short list for like the actual like categories. I really hope to be in it. Like I just have this weird like feeling that because of my accent that I, people are just gonna be like, she's not in Ireland. It's like I'm from Donegal. But anyway, I've been talking for too long, so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber and fact me. In fact you I will. But first, we've gotta get our source on. Our sources are Alice, Princess Andrew of Greece by Hugo Vickers A Short History of Modern Greece by Richard Clogg Mountbatten by Philip Ziegler History.com, Biography.com and DevHistory.eu Are you sitting comfortably? Good, then let's begin. On the 25th of February 1885, Princess Alice was born in the Tapestry Room in Windsor Castle, in the UK. Alice was the first of four children by Prince Louis of Battenberg and Princess Victoria of Hesse and Byrhine. And you will never guess who was in attendance, none other than her great-grandmother, Queen Victoria herself. Now, Queen Victoria, who was a massive fan of you know, ether, which would become gas and air. Like, it's the, the starting point of it. Because, you know, she was like, yep, yeah, I've given birth loads of times. This is fantastic. Everyone should use it. Yes. But anyway, um, that's just a sidebar. But th- this is a thing. This is a bugbear of mine and it annoys me so much. And it makes things very confusing because... When you want to talk about, like, especially people in history, it's really fucking tough when everybody's got the same name or at least similar names or, oh, yeah. Um, especially when it comes to, like, older, like, texts because you find out stuff and then you have to cross-reference it so many times to make sure it is the specific person that you're thinking about. Anyway. And also, I have said this before and I will say it again. Your family tree should not be a wreath. And to add on to that, tack it on to the end of this, if your family tree does happen to be a wreath, give people different names. It's just an option. I just feel like you need some variation there somewhere. So, Princess Alice, her mother is Princess Victoria, whose mother is Princess Alice, whose mother is Queen Victoria. Henry, Stephen, Henry, Stephen, Henry, Richard, John, Oi. Yeah, yeah, there, there, so many, so many. Wait, did I get the beginning of the monarch song wrong? Maybe I did. But anyway, it's like, Victoria, Alice, Victoria, Alice, let's, let's, let's not. Maybe, maybe let's not. But anyway, Alice, like many royals, has a fuck ton of names because, I don't know, reasons. Have you ever had to see someone, sidebar, write out like many many names i have an auntie who has like five names so like for four name middle name middle name middle name middle name and then surname and so she was trying to 
like legally do her wedding certificate and she had to do each name like super tiny to fit them all in it's like maybe consider this like anyone who's about to have kids just think about the length of their name when filling out forms it's just an idea so alice she gets christened on the 25th of april 1885 and this is in darmstadt in and she she has the names the names so many names okay so victoria alice elizabeth julia marie battenberg right that's <laughs> that's she has so many titles so many names okay so she has all these names and she has like a bunch of godparents like six of them or something there's a lot there's more than there should be but they just you know why i don't know because like there should be two and just be done with it but i don't know royals i guess so she ends up having three younger siblings so louise george and louis a- again again louise and Lu- just just pick some other names just anything like you're from all these different countries pick a name so anyway her three siblings louise becomes the queen of sweden george is the marquess of milford haven and Louis becomes Earl Mountbatten of Burma. But back to Alice. So Alice spends the majority of her childhood between like London, Jugendheim, Darmstadt and Malta. Um, because her dad's also like a naval officer. Even though he wasn't supposed to be because uh, he failed the medical. But uh, they let him in anyway because they didn't want to offend Queen Victoria. <laughs> Anywho. So... She's not doing well growing up because her mum is very worried because she noticed that her pronunciation, it isn't distinct, it isn't definite and she thinks something's wrong. Is she, they, they kind of, how do I put this? Um, they basically say she's slow, like that is the term they use and it's actually her grandmother, right? Princess Battenberg, who identifies the issue. And so she takes Alice to see an ear specialist. And it's this point where she's diagnosed with congenital deafness. So she was born deaf, right? So, or at the very least, hard of hearing. So she's at least partially deaf. And so her mother, Victoria, decides that in order for Alice to to grow and learn and I this is a little bit of tough love and I get where it's coming from but also you know it just feels a bit rough um she told people that if they said anything around Alice to not repeat it to sort of force Alice to learn uh, to lip read effectively and so she manages to learn to lip read in both English and German because like those are the two languages really spoken you know in the royal household and she is fluent in this she is fluent in lip reading and speaking english and german by the age of eight and so at some point as well she privately studies french so she can do it in french as well and then later on i'm skipping a wee bit but later on when she gets married she also learns greek like because she's awesome So she really grows up, like, surrounded by royals. Because, you know, she is one. Like, before she's even ten, she's a bridesmaid for the Duke of York and Mary of Tech. Who are going to be, like, King George and Queen Mary. You know, the other one down the line. So, when she's just shy of 16, I think it is, Queen Victoria dies. And so everybody moves up one in the line of succession. So yes, 1901... Two major things happen for Alice. One, her great-grandmother, the Queen of England, she dies. And two, she is confirmed into the Anglican faith. So she has her confirmation, right? So with Victoria passed away, her eldest son, Edward, or Albert Edward, eh, becomes Edward VII. He is now king. But his coronation doesn't happen until the following year. 
when Alice is 17. So here's the thing about coronations, is it tends to bring a lot of royals out. And there's a big royal family at this point. They're all interconnected, mainly through Victoria. Again, the wreath situation. So a lot of them come in. And who happens to show up at this coronation? But Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark. So he's like the fourth son of King George I of Greece and Olga Konstantinova of Russia. I don't know why I did that. I can't help myself. When You know when you learn names and then you learn it from people who speak those languages and then you end up like copying that phrasing? I think it's an ADHD thing. Don't quote me on it. How do you know she's got ADHD? Have you listened to her podcast? She can't keep a single train of thought going. There are several trains going at once. Some are stalled at stations. Some have somehow created their own tracks. <laughs> Why? We don't know. That's just how it goes here. So she falls absolutely head over heels in love with Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark. And so they get engaged and they get married in October 1903. So they end up having like three ceremonies all in all because why have one wedding when you can have three? Says the person who's been engaged thrice and still is unwed. <laughs> that says more about me, I guess. So, yes, they are married on the 6th of October in 1903 in a civil ceremony at Darmstadt. So like the next day, they have two religious ceremonies. The first is in the Evangelical Castle Church and it's a Lutheran one and the next one is in the Russian chapel on the Matilden Hall which is a Greek Orthodox because she's Church of England and he's Greek Orthodox so you know ticking all the boxes for everybody. So they have this. So they get married and lo and behold Princess Alice she moves to Greece. So she's Princess Alice of Battenberg, but she's also styled Princess Andrew of Denmark and Greece. So like sometimes when you're reading about Princess Alice of Battenberg, it will just call her Princess Andrew. Like it's, it's not confusing. It's a wee bit confusing, but it's just weird, I think, for me. But anyway, so she is really well loved by the people of Greece. Like the people of Greece fucking love her. So she's loved by the Greeks, she's loved by Constantine, the king. Like, he thinks she's fucking fantastic. And Andrew and her, they're very much in love. Like, or at least she's very much in love with him. The two of them are just very, very well connected. And they go on to have five children, all in all, who then go on to have more. It, it's a whole thing. But yet after the wedding, Andrew basically leaps back into his naval career because he's the fourth son. Like, he's not getting much. So he needs to do something. And one of the things, you know, the are your options is going into the military somehow. The Navy, for some reason, it's deemed as more respectable than other sort of factions of the military. I don't know particularly why. Hmm. Maybe someone else can explain to me why being on a boat is more impressive than flying a plane or that. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, they're there and she ends up having Margarita in 1905. Her daughter, not the pizza. I'm not saying Princess Alice tried a margarita pizza for the first time in 1905. I mean, for all I know, she could have. Maybe she visited Italy. I don't know if she was there or if she tried a pizza. I, I I don't feel like it's entirely relevant either. But anyway, her daughter Margarita is born in 1905, followed by Theodora in 1906. Like, boom, boom, one after the other. The royals were really pushing it because here's the thing. If you have a womb, you are only fertile for a small period of time. And... You know, there's a very limited time after having children that you can become pregnant again. Like, there has to be, like, a, a waiting period. You know what I mean? Usually, there's, like, a space because your body tends to heal itself a little before, you know. So, do you have children pretty soon after each other, especially when pregnancy is closer to 10 months than it is to 9? Mm. Just saying. 
you know, they were having a ball. She has Margarita, then Theodora, and then she doesn't have kids for a wee while. So being a royal, she's generally expected to do royal things, like attend royal weddings. And so she does. She goes to the wedding of Prince William of Sweden and the Grand Duchess Marie of Russia. So her aunt, Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodorovna, she is of the mindset, kind of like Countess Markovich actually, she has this idea of sort of giving away her worldly goods. So what she wants to do is create a foundation for an order of nurses, which are like a religious order of nurses, you know. And and this is going to lay the foundation for stuff that's going to happen later on. So in 1911, her third daughter was born, Cecily. And political tensions are rising in Greece. And it's becoming quite apparent. Then, in 1912, the Balkan War start. And they last until 1913. And Andrew, being a naval officer, he has to go do his thing. And Alice does something that's really unexpected. And that's she goes out on the front lines and starts establishing field hospitals. And runs them. Like, she's not just doing nothing. She's not just, like, cutting a ribbon. She's there, hands-on, organising the day-to-day, making sure supplies are going out. Like, she's... She's really doing something. She's going out there to help people. Like, she's nursing. Like, she's doing all this shit, right? And so impressed is the king with this, right? So amazingly impressed at all the shit she's doing like, during the Balkan Wars, King George V awards her the Royal Red Cross. Which is really fucking impressive. Like, because to be a princess and to physically get out and put yourself in danger to help people is, like, a weird enough situation to exist anyway. When you think of how she was raised and the society and... The culture in which she, as a descendant of Queen Victoria, especially, you know, the manner in which she grew up, that she's going out, especially when she's at a disadvantage, because, you know, because lest we forget, she can't hear shit. Or at least, not a lot of it. So after the Balkan Wars in 1914, Princess Sophie is born. And the First World War erupts. So there is this whole issue because the political system within Greece, I mean, it's its very complicated and heavy, but effectively there's a democratically elected government and there's also a monarchy. So the government have voted and they want to support the Allies during the Great War. But King Constantine, who's Alice's brother-in-law, he doesn't want to get involved He wants to take a neutral stance because he's related very closely to the German nobility and he's also related very closely to the British nobility. You know, there's there's a lot of sort of connections either side and he just does not feel like he should be involved in this. Unfortunately, it gets to the point that this situation is just not feasible and the family's personal safety is really being called into question because in 1916, Princess Alice and her children are sheltering in the cellars of the palace during the French bombardment of 1916. And that's like early December, but then by early 1917... Constantine, his neutrality thing, it's not working. It's its its buggered up, right? He's absolutely buggered up. And they have to go. He has to abdicate. So that's what he does. He abdicates the throne. He relinquishes his title. And then Alice and her family, they're exiled from Greece. Like, this is a woman who has just consistently 
given to a country, and this is a country that in general loved her. Just kind of the other ones they weren't too keen on, you know? And so they have buggered off to Switzerland, right? And during this time as well, like, they have to, like, get rid of titles and change names. And so they sort of anglicise Battenberg and change it to the Mount Batten because there's, like, anti-German sentiment. It's, like, a whole situation. And she doesn't change hers, though. Alice is like, no, I'm good. <laughs> and everyone else is like, I'm Mount Batten and I am this. And she's like, mm, no, I'm fine. So this is, shockingly enough, a... Uh, really fucking stressful and it's like playing on her and then to add more shit to the dung heap because the world just cannot stop just trying to drown this woman in 1918 during the russian revolution two of her aunts one of which we know she's really close to so the empress alexander fyodorovna and grand duchess elizabeth fyodorovna are murdered by bolsheviks and then, this is like the fall of all of these dynasties, like, all over Europe. So all these monarchies and their power, they're crumbling, they're falling, they're gone. So you've got um, the Austro-Hungarian empires and Russian and German. They've all practically dissolved. And all people really have at this point is, you know, whatever goods they could snatch with them and their titles. Because labels, weirdly, seem to be very important. Like, I'm fairly certain the same kind of people that get mad about someone referring to themselves as non-binary or gender fluid or, or arrow ace are the same kind of people who would get really mad if you called, you know, Prince William by something that wasn't his title. Like, they'd be like, you're not showing respect. Neither are you, arsehole. Like oh titles are important in this context but not not in this one okay okay so skip forward a few years and in 1920 king constantine the first is reinstated he's back being king of greece right back in he goes super duper so he's there and this means that alice and her family can move back to greece and they're there and this this is short-lived because of the Greco-Turkish War, which they lose. And at this point, Princess Alice is pregnant with Prince Philip. Can you imagine the stress and strain this woman is under? Not only is she pregnant again, so dealing with all the stress and the hormones and everything dealing with that, but she's in the midst of a very strenuous political situation like it's tumultuous to say the least and there's a war going on yet again and she can't do anything about it partially because she's pregnant and partially because you know it's happening in Asia Minor now I can't remember exactly if you know Greece is defeated and then she gives birth or she gives birth and then Greece is defeated but it, they're very close in the timeline so Andrew, Prince Andrew, being of the military, like at the time of the defeat, like a lot of other sort of generals, he is arrested and he goes on trial. And see, what happens to a lot of these generals and a lot of these military leaders is they are executed. And Constantine, yet again, has to abdicate his throne. So... Their protection there is basically gone. Like, they don't have that buffer anymore. And so the British royal family, they are convinced that Prince Andrew is in danger. Like, the key's at high risk of being executed because all of these other generals have. And they had already learnt their lesson about the Tsar and Tsarina and their children. And so they didn't want that to happen again because they they could have helped them but didn't i think it's because they weren't aware that it was going to result in their deaths um but now they know that's very much a possibility with you know a revolt and so they send in the hms calypso and there's this show trial 
the results of which are him being banished from Greece, as opposed to, you know, other ministers and generals who were just shot after their trials. Yeah. So it's it's kind of on the edge. People are really worried, like diplomats and so forth. They're worried he's going to be executed. And so they're not taking any chances. And Britain arranges for the HMS Calypso to take the prince and princess and all of their children and get them the heck at a dodge. So I've told this story before, but it's like um, Prince Philip was like taking on this cruiser in an orange crate. And like, I think I I use the frame smuggled because like it's always kind of referred to as smuggled on. But they weren't like sneaking away under the cover of night. They, They basically just needed something to put them in. And they didn't really have an option to bring a lot of stuff with them because they needed to go. And so they put them in an orange crate because, like, that's what they had. That'll do for a crib. It's the right size. You know, yeah, does the job. And it's at this point that Princess Alice and her husband, Prince Andrew, they become very reliant on their families for, you know, finance and protection. And so they end up staying in this um, small house. I say small house. It's fairly, it's decent sized. I mean, I've seen small houses. This is fine. It's in Saint-Claude. It's on the outskirts of Paris. And it is owned by Marie Bonaparte, who is married to Prince George of Greece. Because, you know, she happens to have a house in France. They can go stay in this house in France. And so while Princess Alice is there, what she does is she gets involved in these um, charity shops. So she started doing this stuff and starts working in these areas in order to help Greek refugees. Like the first thing she does, hands on, wants to help. Now, the strain and pressure of everything that has been happening to her, it has been building. And in 1928, she becomes, I want to say, like, very religious. Like, she starts really leaning into her faith. And she ends up converting from Anglicanism to the Greek Orthodox Church. And at this point as well, the marriage between Prince Andrew and Princess Alice, it is strained, to say the least. And and over the next two years, it deteriorates, kind of like her mental state. So she starts claiming that she is getting messages from the divine, like she's getting information from Jesus and the Buddha and that she is intimate with them. There's no definition as to what this intimate is. Now, people have often made their own conclusions from this. Some people have said it's sort of sexual in nature. And some people say that it's it's not sexual nature at all, but more of like an emotional intimacy. But either way, it's enough to worry the fuck out of her mother. So Princess Victoria ends up sending Alice to just like a bunch of doctors. And they diagnose her with paranoid schizophrenia. Alice is then brought to a sanatorium in Berlin where this diagnosis is confirmed. You know what's weird to me though? Is like, I keep feeling this is more of a, you know, stress-related mental deterioration or a psychotic break as opposed to like schizophrenia. Because weirdly enough, like even though it says she's receiving messages, it doesn't say how. Because like I couldn't see any documentation of hallucinations. And and typically, like, the most prominent symptoms for schizophrenia are usually auditory or visual hallucinations. And, I mean, I'd be surprised if they were auditory, but, like, I'm not seeing hallucinations anywhere. I mean, I know it's not always the case, but it just feels like, like, they're, they're just, like, to the side of the mark. It feels like they've almost got it, but it just feels like this diagnosis is more complicated and nuanced than what they're calling it. I mean, granted though, it is the early 20th century, so pinch of salt, I suppose. And yeah, I mean, on top of that as well, sanatoriums at this point are still pretty new. Like, it's still a pretty novel concept. 
But yeah, after this diagnosis is confirmed, she is then sent to Switzerland to the Kruslingen Sanatorium, run by Ludwig Binswanger. And like the weird thing is, is like this particular sanatorium was where like celebrities and royals went. Like there, there was a few. It's peculiar, but it, it is. And then Binswanger also diagnosed her with schizophrenia. And what happens to Princess Alice in this sanatorium is weird. It's really fucking weird. So, because Binswanger, he decides he's going to correspond with none other than Sigmund Freud about Princess Alice. Because he's looking for advice and recommendations and, you know, just, just floating ideas back and forth. And... Sigmund Freud suggests, strong suggests, basically makes happen that Princess Alice should have her ovaries x-rayed in order to sort of kickstart menopause, right? Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, And sometimes, even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow even the royals on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half and the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. He told a doctor, another doctor, to radiate a woman's womb. To force a menopause upon her that her body wasn't ready for. Because, shockingly enough, he believed all of the issues stemmed from her libido. He had decided that Princess Alice of Battenberg was too damn horny. And that's where her issues stemmed from. And you know where this all came from? I mean, the Jesus stuff and the Buddha stuff? Mm, you, no, no, none of that. It's because one of her ladies-in-waiting said that when she was working in her charity shop in Greece, it's that she had started this emotional affair with a Frenchman. And nothing physical happened, it wasn't acted upon, but that this was a trigger for her current mental state. And because of this, they decided that they were going to radiate her womb. And just when you think it couldn't get worse, this was done to her without her consent. Because she was not fully informed of what they were going to do. She didn't have an option to discuss it or to challenge it. 
This was forced upon her, and she attempted to flee the sanatorium on several occasions. And all the while, her husband and her, they are becoming estranged. And all of her daughters, they marry German princes. And she doesn't attend any of their weddings, you know, because she's in a sanatorium. So at one point, she signs herself out of the sanatorium and she goes back to see Philip. And she hasn't seen him in years. But her mother, Princess Victoria, decides that she just isn't well enough. Like, she needs to go back to the sanatorium. But here's the thing. Like, this is a woman who, like, tried to leave several times and they wouldn't let her. And this is the time they let her go. They let her sign herself out. But her mother decided that just wasn't good enough. And so Princess Victoria takes Prince Philip out for a picnic. And when he comes back from the picnic, his mother's gone. And he doesn't see her again for several years. And during this time as well, Philip is sent to England, to the Mount Battens, to his uncles. And so after two years of being forcibly radiated in a sanatorium in Switzerland, Princess Alice is finally released. So yeah, two years. Two years. And here's the thing. None of these fucking guys actually knew what they were doing. Like, they were physically making her unwell. They were giving her radiation treatment. They could have killed her. Like, very easily. They didn't know this was going to work. They didn't know this was just an idea. And the weirdest thing of all is that it came from Freud. Because Freud, as we know, out of everything, is a talker. He believed in the talking method. That's like what he's famous for. That and the, you know, psychosexual stages of maturation. But, you know, he's all about finding the core root, you know, of this trauma and working from there. Granted, he thinks the core root of your trauma is your fucking libido, but that's neither here nor there. The fact is, you're supposed to work through this and figure it out and you know, introspection. Not just x-ray the womb, like what the actual fuck. But yeah, after being effectively tortured for two whole years, and she goes, she's released, and off she goes to a life in Europe. Now she talks to her mother, and there's some correspondence with Cecily, but she basically doesn't really communicate with her family. I mean, she kind of goes incognito. She's just trying to just live her life. And I'm not surprised she isn't talking to some of the people because, you know, she's been in a sanatorium for two fucking years. And Philip did visit her at least once in there. And he was so young at the time. I don't think he truly understood what was happening. You know, he didn't really know what it was or what they were doing to her or how it had affected her. Because he signed the book Philip of No Fixed Abode, you know, and I think it really, it must have affected him. Like, I don't care who you are, like, your mother being locked away from you, that can't be good as a kid, you know? But yeah, for the most part, she's not really communicating with her family, she's just, like, laying low. And... It's only when her daughter Cecily dies. And so Cecily and her husband and three of her children, and then I think there's like a friend as well, they all pass away in this airplane crash. They're supposed to be on the way to a wedding, but the plane gets into trouble and it crashes and it just kills everyone on board. Now, um, I do go into this a little bit more in the Prince Philip episode, so if you want to go back and listen there, but I'm... I might discuss Cecily or her sisters in a future episode, but yeah, this isn't about them. This is about Alice. So yeah, her daughter and her grandkids, they're they're gone. And so she meets members of her family for the first time in years at her daughter's funeral. And it's the first time her and Prince Andrew have seen each other, just in for yonks. Like, it's the first time she sees Philip in so long. Like, her youngest. Like, 
That's a big deal for her. And this tragedy, it makes her reconnect with her family. Like She starts communicating with them again. And she ends up moving back to Athens in this like two bedroom like apartment and she's there and she's settled and she wants her son Philip to return there and live there with her. But the Mount Barons, they think it's best that he stays in the UK, join the Navy and give himself a career, an option, a leg up. So Princess Alice of Battenberg, she's staying in Athens along with her sister-in-law, Princess Nicholas of Greece. Like, they're not living together, they just both happen to be there. The two of them, they're in Athens, and the majority of the Greek royal family, they're in, like, South Africa, just, like, exiled away, no touchy, no touchy. And it's where they are when World War II breaks out. And Princess Alice, she's already been there, she's been working with the poor. Now, she does move out of her, like, little, like, flat by the museum, and she ends up moving into a three-story house owned by, I think it's her brother-in-law, George? So she moves in there, and she starts working with the Red Cross, boots on the ground, organising soup kitchens, but wait, there's more. So because her sister is the Queen of Sweden, and because, you know, and her sister-in-law is in Greece. She has a perfectly viable and reasonable reason to travel. And so that's what she does. She goes to Sweden, collects supplies and food and all this other stuff, brings it back to Greece and just keeps doing this back and forth. And Princess Alice isn't really bothered too much mainly because of the fact it's assumed that she's pro-German. So it's really funny for her. So she's got one son who is fighting for the Allies. And then she has, was it two son-in-laws? Three? Three son-in-laws who are like German princes and who, they're Nazis. They end up being Nazis. So... Yeah, bit, bit weird. But it also gives her this sort of element of power. So the Axis forces, they have been in Athens since 1941. And when Mussolini falls in 43, that's when German troops really just come in and seize control. So at one point, this is really funny, I love this fucking story. At one point, this... German general comes up to her because he assumes that she's on their side because, you know, like one son-in-law's in the Waffen SS, like, you know, I mean, and he's like, you, yeah, what, is there anything, anything I can do for you? And she's like, she's a chain smoker, so I like the idea of her just like watching this man in just taking this long puff of a cigarette, like, you can take your troops out of my country. I also like to imagine that she blows smoke directly into his face and then puts the cigarette ash out on his shoulder, like, tap, tap, (laughs) onto his shoes. (laughs) Like, I just, yeah, Um, I'd like to imagine it happened that way. Like, she did say, like, you can take your trips out of my country. I just love that. Sidebar, if I'm ever going to be haunted by a royal ghost, I want it to be Princess Alice. Because one, um, she's a badass and two, she makes exceedingly good cakes. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself with that one. No, um, because like I just want a chain smoking, like Canastas playing, like nun nurse princess to just be really sarcastic. (laughs) Just, ah, what's that? It's the smell of a marble light. (laughs) Ah, Princess Alice is here. She's here to judge you. (laughs) So in 1943, the Nazis, they, they're just occupying Athens at this point. And previous to this, there was like 60,000 Greek Jews sort of like in refuge there. And the majority of them, I think all but 2,000. So like 58,000, give or take, are murdered by Nazis. They're sent to concentration camps. And they're murdered. 
And during this time, a widow, Sophie Cohen, is in Athens with two of her five children. And Princess Alice, her maid, actually sees Rachel like walking in the street. They were looking for her. They knew she was in Athens, but they didn't know where. So when her maid sees her, she's like, we were looking for you. Come the fuck with us. And so Princess Alice actively chose to hide three Jewish people in her house. So Rachel and two of her kids. And she keeps them there until, you know, at the end of the war. And like, it's actually really funny. So when she's being like pressed by, you know, Nazis, they're coming in, they're trying to interrogate her and you know, threaten her and stuff and so on and so forth. And she's, she's deaf. Like, she's hard of hearing and people know that she's deaf and hard of hearing. But she just, like, really plays it up. I love, I love it's a thing that older people do. It's like, <laughs> it's like they really lean into it. They're like, I'm sorry, what? Oh, I can't hear you because um I don't want to. And I love that. I love that. It's like, um I had a friend who had a hearing head and she would just, like, turn it off. When she didn't want to listen to people <laughs> was my favorite thing. I was like, ah, oh. like I understand, you know, having to have a hearing aid is, is you know, I mean, it's good because you can hear, but it's bad because, you know, you need a hearing aid. Um, But to be able to just like switch off and not have to listen to people just seems like a really cool thing. Just whoop, and off. But anyway, I'm digressing. When Athens is liberated in 1944, it is discovered that Princess Alice has not been living in the best of conditions. Like, she's been eating, like, a wee bit of bread and butter, um, but she hasn't eaten any meat in months. Like, she's... Like, she's taking care of others before she takes care of herself, and she is living in difficult, difficult conditions. And it's not long after this that Prince Andrew, her husband, passes away. Now, I've seen, like, discussions of reconciliation and reconnection, like, post-war. Like, it's the kind of thing that happens when you have struggled, like, you try and reconnect with people in your life that you've lost. But they weren't really, like, together anymore and they were estranged. And I think if they reconnected, it would be more of a cathartic like, platonic situation as opposed to, you know, a reconnection of a great romantic love story, you know? But that's just my opinion. But yeah, World War II has ended and, um, things haven't improved much in Athens for Princess Alice because there's a wee bit of guerrilla warfare going on between communists and British forces because they're trying to take control of Athens. And... There's a curfew in place, basically telling people, like, stay inside, don't go out, don't do this, you know. And Princess Alice says, fuck this for a game of soldiers. And what does she do? She breaks curfew, she defies British forces, and she goes out and she hands rations and food and other supplies to police officers, children, just anybody who needs it. And so, like... She gets asked if she's worried about being hit by a stray bullet. And again, I like to imagine she's taking a smoke as she does this. Um, like, dressed in her kind of nunnish clothes. Because, like, she's trying to, like, re-establish the order of, like, nurse nuns that her murdered aunt was planning on doing. So she's really kind of, like, feeling this. So I like to imagine she's there with a wee wimple on. And she's taking a smoke. Because... <laughs> Direct quote, I must add. I, I fucking love her so much. They tell me that you don't hear this shot that kills you. And in any case, I am deaf. So why worry about that? Oh, she's a fucking queen. I love her so much. But yeah, so she's out just doing her thing. And um, she actually returns to the UK for the first time in a damn age to attend the wedding of her only son, Prince Philip. So... She actually heads to the UK in April and stays there all the way till November. And see, although Princess Alice didn't have much in the way of belongings, she had kept a hold of some of her jewels. 
were then set in a ring for Princess Elizabeth, or Queen Elizabeth as she would become. So, like, through all of this, she had saved these, and then she had gifted them to her daughter-in-law. Like, that means something. Don't tell me that doesn't mean something. So, like, she's at the wedding, and I think she's, like, the main person on Philip's side. And then on the other side, you've got, like, the king and queen and, you know, Margaret, who's probably just taken a wee shot of whiskey from the side. And none of Philip's sisters are invited because there's such an anti-German sentiment. They're like, <laughs> no, you're Nazis. You're not coming. It's just not an option. But after this, she heads back to Athens. So in 1949, she tries to establish this um, order of Greek Orthodox nuns. So they're like a nursing order of nuns. Non-nurses. Nursing nuns. Say that five times fast. So it's the Christian sisterhood of Martha and Mary. And it's basically, you know, like it's based off the idea of her aunt. So like she establishes the order in Athens and decides she needs to raise funds. So she travels to the US. She does two tours, like in 1950 and 1952, to try and raise money for this order. Um, her her mum, like Princess Victoria, like her mum is just like baffled by this. And she's like, what the actual fucking bullshit is this nonsense? Like you're a nun who smokes and plays canasta. Like, as far as I know, it's like a term of, um, a type of, like, gin rummy. Like, it's a card game. Oh, look, it's Princess Alice of Badassenburg. The card playing, chain smoking, nursing nun. It just sounds like someone just, like, threw a bunch of random attributes together for, like, D&D. It's a nurse who's also a nun. And, uh, and, uh, oh, oh wait, chain, chain smoking. Okay, and loves playing cards. Great. Good, good deck, guys. Good job. But in 1952, Alice's daughter-in-law, Elizabeth, becomes Queen of England. And in 1953, there's a coronation, which Princess Alice attends. Like, it's really funny if you look at the photos, because, like, she's there, and everyone else is in, like, regalia. And there she is in, like, this grey dress and a wee hat that looks like a wimple. Like, it's... It's so funny. It's like it's such a juxtaposition. It's wild. But as per, she shows up. Now, unfortunately for Alice, her order, her Greek Orthodox order, it's kind of more adjacent to Greek Orthodox than being of it because the order fails. Because she doesn't get enough applicants. Like, she doesn't get enough nursing nuns. And so that just kind of, like, fades away. So she's kind of doing her thing anyway, but just not officially. So Alice, being surprisingly enough incredibly spiritual, like she ends up making a connection with Rajkumari Amrit Kaur because he's impressed of Princess Alice's like understanding and interest in Indian religious well, like considerations. And so he invites her to India. And so she goes because, well, she's interested. So when she goes there, she ends up doing like a short tour, but she's not well. Like she just becomes unwell and she has to like leave. And her sister-in-law, who like just happens to be there, she's just in there and by the time. And so she, you know, basically takes over the tour and kind of has to, how to put this, like takes her place because like they don't want to offend like, all of these sort of, like, people who had invited her over. Like, they, they don't want to cause offence and insult. And they have to do the sort of royal diplomacy. So the sister-in-law, when she's out doing this for Alice, like, she dies a month later. Like, she does the wee tour and then, pfft, gone. Now, after this, Princess Alice is back in Greece just doing her thing. Helping the poor. Just... She's in this, I don't want to say house, but kind of house. And the ceiling is leaking. It's not the most structurally sound of buildings. 
and she's not doing great. Like, her health is getting worse. She's getting more and more deaf. Like, everything is deteriorating. Which gets worse, you know, when um, yet another dangerous thing happens in Greece. So, the colonel's coup of 67, right? It makes the royal family, like, genuinely worry for, like, Princess Alice. So they extend an official invitation, and by official invitation, they make her go, effectively. There's an invitation, no, no, you're going. Like, she's gone. So she is invited back to Buckingham Palace. Which, you know, ultimately is better than being exiled. Because King Constantine the Second, like he was in and he tried to do like a counter coup and then him and his wife get exiled. It's again, it's a whole thing. But Princess Alice of Battenberg, she's in Buckingham Palace. She's in London, and that's where she stays for the next two years. And then on the fifth of December, nineteen sixty nine, at the age of eighty four years old. Princess Alice of Denmark passes away. Now, like, there's, there's, you know, kind of rumours that would go around saying that she was going senile, but she was just physically frail. Like, she was old, and she had gone through a lot, and fun fact, um, by going through the menopause early, it can increase risks of things like osteoporosis. So again, they they radiated her and just fucked up her body even worse. I'm just saying. But yeah, she was lucid. Like, she was with it. She just... Her body was weakening. Like, that's it. And so, when she passes away, she is initially interred in the royal crypt at St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle. But, here's the thing. Before she passed away... Like, she, like, let everyone know that she wanted to be buried at the convent of St. Mary Magdalene on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Because she wanted to be buried near her aunt. And so she told her family this. She let them know her wishes. And Princess Sophie was like, it's too far to travel to visit you. And, again, oh, God. Princess Alice, I assume, yet again, taking a talk, just, it's like, Nonsense. There's a perfectly good bus service. T -t -t putting the ash out on her, just like on your shoes. <laughs> but no, um, so 1969, St. George's Chapel in Windsor, which is kind of weird because she was born in Windsor Castle and she's interred there. It's just like a full circle. But yeah, um, in 1988, they decide that they're going to honour her wishes and they transfer her remains to the crypt beneath. St. Mary Magdalene Church. So finally, posthumously, Princess Alice receives two honours. One from Israel at the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. There's this ceremony honouring her as righteous among the nations because, you know, she put herself at great risk sheltering Jewish people from Nazis. And then, like, just over a decade ago, she is honoured as a hero of the Holocaust by the British government. But, like, there were so few books about Princess Alice that are written in English, so I really need to get some more translations, because I feel like there's more information out there. I just haven't been able to get it because I don't, I don't know, read Greek or whatever. But she's so fascinating and so interesting, and I feel there's so much more there. Not that she didn't do a fuck ton, she absolutely did, but I just think we need to know more about her because like her information her story is barely out there and I think she really did something with her life and I think we deserve to talk about her and to know about her more fuck Henry VIII she's more interesting that's all I'm saying so if you liked my retelling of the story of Princess Alice of Bad Assenberg I can't help myself she's just too cool Feel free to rate and review five stars. Say nice things. Say mediocre things. Just give five stars. And, you know, put some positivity in your life. Like, just be 
positive about something to somebody. Like, I'm aggressively positive, but that's a completely different thing entirely. But don't forget you can follow me on all of the social medias. I am on X, I guess. Twitter, X Twitter, X Twitter. Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, so on and so forth. Um, I don't have threads yet because it's not legal in my country, but I am waiting. And I have a Patreon and a tip jar if you want to help support. If you just share stuff even on social media, like that makes all the difference. And also if you like share the podcast amongst your friends, that would be totally cool too. You guys are the best. I'm doing a lot of like elongated noises today and I have no idea why. I do know why actually. It's because my wee girl is not our soul and she does it all the time and now I'm copying her but um recommendation time recommendation time so for watching I'm gonna recommend only murders in the building because I love a cozy mystery and also Selena Gomez because she's so cool and Martin Short is just fucking awesome Steve Martin's fine <laughs> If I ever move Steve Martin, somebody's going to tell him I did this. But it's fine. It's fine. He'll he'll get over it. So, book-wise, I am going to recommend Profit by Sid Blushy and Helen MacDonald. And for listening. Did I recommend the Murder Most Irish podcast last time? I don't know if I did. But if I didn't, or even if I did, go listen to them. They are victim first. They are fabulous. They're awesome. So go listen to them. And yeah, with that, I am going to say good evening. And I shall bid you farewell. Adios. Au revoir. Au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.